Welcome everyone to our VA SIN Field of Real Building Care Economies Learn In. Today we really wanted to bring folks from across the state who were doing work around the care economy to explore the idea of what it means to kind of structure our economy around care and what it looks like to build more caring economies in practice. So we recognize that current economic and social systems and infrastructures don't always center the needs that people in communities uh, required to throb and flourish. And so we've convened a panel of folks from across the state who are really work doing work that centers uh, economies of care. And so that's why we're here today. And I'm so happy to see y'all. Thanks, Garrett, and welcome everyone. I'm Lindsay, and I'm gonna get us started by acknowledging the land that we're on and inviting us to lift up the work of um, indigenous peoples of the land that we're on. Um, and then I'll invite you all to introduce yourselves as well. This is um, a land acknowledgement that we've been sharing at the beginning of each of our learnings and it's been adapted from the nonprofit democracy network. So I want to invite you all to, to settle in um, as I read through our acknowledgement. We acknowledge that we belong to the land. The land does not belong to us. We are each on land that has been tended by and cared for by indigenous peoples who are in deep relationship with the land for the benefit of both human and non-human beings. These indigenous people are here today, many still on their ancestral lands, many still embodying and preserving essential wisdom in the face of colonization and all whose lives reflect the beauty that lies beyond colonization. So we bow to these people and we acknowledge too that each of us comes from a line that at some point was rooted in place. We wanna invite everyone to take a moment and acknowledge the peoples that belong to the land you are on. Um, and we'll also put a link in the chat to help you learn the names of the people and indigenous names of the places where you dwell. This is also an invitation to share indigenous led work that's happening where you are. Within the Virginia Solidarity Economy Network, we're committed to addressing the histories and forces that have stolen and renamed land and to work towards transformative relationships that can shift power, resources, and land back to indigenous people. So we wanna build these relationships and make connections um, with all of you and with indigenous led groups as well. Um, so please share with us in the chat groups um, and people that you feel like we should be building connections with. While you're doing this, of course, introduce yourselves as well. Let us know who you are and where you're calling from. All right, I think we are good to start. I'm correct. Our first speaker will be Barbara Hishworm. Barbara is a social gerontologist focusing on developing initiatives that build community resource capacity for older residents on or, or that promote civic uh, knowledge among people of all ages. Um, so I believe Barbara has a presentation or some things that she's ready to share. So if you're ready to go ahead and share that, I'll pass it over to you. Sure. I put together a file and it just, in the process of trying to pull together what I knew and what I didn't know. And um, I think the important, one of the important things is to talk about um, home care. I'm going to talk about home health care workers and um, some trajectory and some alternatives. And I think it's important to acknowledge that historically, I mean, you know, for millennia, families have taken care of their own frail 
and disabled family members. Um, and it's almost always been in the, in the home context, the family home context. Uh, people died at all points across the life course until fairly recently. Uh, and um, frail and disabled family members died at all points across the life course. And of course, no big surprise here, but female family members, mothers, sisters, grandmothers, and, and then if someone was hired in, then, then female hired workers were the ones that were doing the, the hands-on care. And in the South, historically, those who either owned slaves um, before the war or hired domestic workers at any point would use those workers to take care of frail or infirm family members. Everybody else um, just took care of whoever it was, their brother or their son or their you know, daughter. And someone could become frail or disabled at any point in the life course. I mean, they might've been born that way. They might've had measles and encephalitis at the age of 12 and then just been mentally disabled for the rest of their lives. They might've fallen in a, a farm-related accident uh, at the age of 40. But people generally took care of their own or, or else they didn't, uh, depending on the situation. But a lot has changed in the last 40 years nationwide in a lot of countries with the spike in, in the age of, in people 60 and over and then 70 and over and 85 and over, et cetera, et cetera. Et cetera. So living longer, but with multiple chronic health conditions. And um, as a result of public health changes to modern medicine technology. So we have all these people surviving into advanced old age. It's a lot of chronic conditions, but for some of them, their functional status is, is, is challenged. Lately, you can see some of these projections for older Virginians uh, up to 2020 and then, then projections e even further. So who's gonna take care of these people? Most of us are not living in, in multi-generational households. Community, home and community-based services in this country and, and certainly still in Virginia, we're still, from what I can see, I'm a fairly new resident here, uh, it's, it's still based on a mid-century, 20th century model. It's a medical model um, as to who determines patient care and funding streams. And yet, who, who's actually doing the, the hands-on care? It's not the family. So the reality on the ground uh, with chronic diseases is that people want to remain in their homes for as long as possible. They may be, they have mild functional status changes or it might be rather extreme, but they, they want to age in place as the language it is. And uh, they need help with their instrumental activities of daily living, like taking their meditations, taking a short walk, routine phone calls. And even with um, some of the more basic activities of daily living, like bathing and getting out of a chair and getting dressed. And, and all of this can mean the difference between um, remaining in uh, your own home uh, or moving to a more restrictive and costly environment, costly for all, costly for the individual, for family, if the individual has a family that they're in a healthy relationship with this community and society at large. So who's gonna do it and, and how are they gonna do it? Home care workers, who are these workers? Basically personal care aides, assisting with these ADLs and IADLs and maybe doing some housekeeping duties and home health workers, home health aides. And the, these are more medically oriented, healthcare related oriented, monitoring their vitals and assisting with um, personal care activities, administering uh, prescribed medications, um, reporting to nurses and, and doctors and family members. But in this country, following historical model, we're talking about uh, home health care workers who are predominantly, well, overwhelmingly female. A large proportion are people of color, so therefore women of color. Many immigrant workers, it's physically demanding work, leading to a disproportionate ship rate of on-the-job injuries. It requires a lot of physical stamina, problem-solving capacities, competencies related to health care delivery, and a lot of interpersonal skills to deal with uh, cognitive and physical decline issues, isolation, if people are isolated, or uh, conversely, if they're aggravated with an aggravating family relationship, 
all of these um, are necessary and all of them are typical of home health workers. Nevertheless, care work, women's work, classified as low wage in the labor market, unskilled or low skilled workers. And guess what? This justifies low pay rates, poor benefit structure, minimum on the job training in most cases, scan opportunities for promotion, lack of recognition or inclusion often in the members healthcare team, not always, but often. Some people are fun, uh, have home care uh, funded through um, Medicaid agency and, and some through the Older Americans Act. Uh, many are um, private, uh, uh, privately subsidizing or going through um, private or nonprofit charities. A lot of people are, are paying out of pocket. It, so it's, it's a challenging situation for everyone. It's, in Virginia, from what I've read so far, there are ceilings to who, of course, is Medicaid eligible, and in many cases, it involves spending down your resources to get Medicaid eligible. And so it, it can be quite costly, especially if you don't have long-term care insurance, and that's most people. I wanted to show you some um, uh, information on some cooperatives, the uh, home health care cooperatives. Um, there are a couple that have been in existence for quite some time. Um, most are fairly recent, but given the fact that we're at a kind of moment in time where uh, there are labor market pressures to expand the home health care workforce, especially with the recent history of uh, what's happened with COVID and uh, the bailing out of a lot of people who um, are are looking for alternative employment that's not so taxing uh, on them. Uh, but with the same low wage rate, they may as well be doing something that's not as physically taxing. And at the same time, we, we have the aging of the first cusp of the baby boom, which is you know reaching 75 and older. You do have a lot of people who are older and want to stay in their homes. I need mean, home health care workers. So it's putting pressure on the home and community-based healthcare services. In the main, workers to get paid have to go through uh, a middleman, have to go through some agency that um, takes a big cut. They're fed up with that. They're not interested in continuing to make a low wage with no promotional opportunities, little or no benefit structure, and uh, having some kind of middleman agency take a large cut. This is kind of the grandmother of home health care aid co-ops in, uh, in the U.S., it's headquartered in the Bronx. It, it is the nation's largest worker-owned co-op with over 1,700 workers. Employees get dividends in good years. There's um, some solid upfront job training, uh, four-week course, training course uh, right at the beginning. They're training 600 low-income women of color to earn uh, P PCA or uh, personal care assistance or home health assistance certificates every year. Guaranteed jobs. Uh, again, you know, these are Medicaid or, or, or dual eligible Medicaid, Medicare clients. They also collaborate with the S local SEIU. So the starting salary is a little higher. You're going to need that in New York, but I, you know, this is certainly just not even barely a li minimum, a living wage in, in just about any environment. They'll get dental health and life insurance benefits and paid time off. Uh, other benefits as well, financial literacy, lower access to low interest emergency loans. And then in 2019, training for a partnering with a, lo a local, with a, uh, the Public Health Institute, and um, which actually has, is um, headquartered in the Bronx, and a, a nonprofit that uh, focuses on older adults and disability community. So they, They've got a path forward to a promotion to become care coordinators, which is a higher level occupation, and working in a meaningful uh, way to incorporate home health care workers in uh, medical decision making, uh, having them included in client medical decision making in a serious and respectful way. One that's been recently launched is uh, in Yolo County where the uh, California Center for Cooperative Development actually did it, decided to do a study uh, because they saw a caregiver crisis in the area where uh, workers were just fed up 
with the whole range, the poor working conditions, um, the lack of advancement, the low wages, and you know, having to deal with the middleman taking a big cut, and clients were unhappy with services. So uh, CCD, CCCD initiated this health uh, care worker co-op in Yolo County, that's um, Davis area, emphasizes solidarity, support, teamwork, continuous improvement in operations. But that's recently getting off the ground. I wanted to also just mention five locate different locations. It's a it's a collaborative ecosystem, as they call it, caregiver ecosystem of five co-ops in the Was in Washington State around on the peninsula, the northwest corner of Washington. It works with the Northwest Cooperative Development Group, an umbrella group nurturing co-op development in the Pacific Northwest. Uh, across the five, they now employ 96 workers, um, averaging $2 more per hour than their local competitors. Uh, they stress cooperation among cooperatives, uh, work-life balance, and a lot of training um, for the workers, but also administrators, board of directors, and so forth. I know there's interest in maybe developing a co-op in a rural area. I was in touch uh, several, many, well, not many, decade ago with rural small town Wisconsin co-op, which at the time was in, I don't know, you might help me out here with the pronunciation, Matt Altagami. I even have their kind of, not articles of incorporation, but their kind of rules of the road at the time. I'm not sure what the, the, um, the trajectory here is. They're now in uh, uh, several different counties in this area. Altagami, but also Marquette, when uh, Green, Columbia. I can't exactly figure out all of the Adams as well. I know they've expanded, but I'm not. I, I I think this is to be continued that conversation. I'm not exactly sure how they're operating. I have some potential next steps that we might do as a group, besides discussing whether we really want to how and 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 in what way we want to go forward, looking at the possibility of a home care co-op in this area or somewhere in Virginia. Uh, I have um, a file of potential next steps, people to get in touch with, educational podcasts to watch, funding to explore for exploratory work, including Capital Impact Partners, the Development Bank Group, um, you know, it's a major CDFI in the area, and the Cooperative Development Foundation, as well as the USDA grant that um, Matt suggested. Uh, if you notice with um, all of these, well, not, I don't know about the Wisconsin people, but the ones I, I just described, they, they're partnering with local or regional uh, cooperative development organizations, philanthropies, unions. Um, they, they're not doing this on their own. Uh, I also have some a file with some more uh, source material uh, related to um, awareness building, the National Home Care Co-op Conference, which was in 2020, and it's been around for the last five or six years. Some interesting PR for attracting workers, attracting clients. I have saw their literature in another file as well. So I'm just going to open up the space to anyone if they have any um, reflection so far about what Barbara presented um, before moving on to our next speaker, which is Jess. Hi, I'm Adria. She, her pronouns. Hi, Adria. Hi, I'm so happy to be with you all. I um, And I really appreciated Barbara's presentation. It was funny because I am just finishing up a research project myself on worker cooperatives in the health and care sectors. And I was literally drafting the introduction to the edited volume when I saw the email about this Zoom tonight, and it just resonated so much because as I've been documenting worker cooperatives in the healthcare sector, it's just re I've learned so much about the health sector, health sector of sort of the health provision itself um, and how it's organized, how it's organized to concentrate profits in the hands of the shareholders and investors, um, the abusive ways that it, we treat workers in the health sector. And then 
as you all are pointing to, just kind of like the fact that there's this much, much broader circle of health-related care work that goes uncompensated or undercompensated, that is invisible when you look at the statistics that are collected about the formal health sector, et cetera. Um, but anyway, I just wanted to, so thank you for, for zo zooming in on it, like just such a totally crucial topic for our aging society. Um, and Barbara, I was so interested in your presentation because I myself wrote case studies on nine cooperatives this year, and I did get to interview the five Washington State home care co-ops, which was so fascinating. And everything I found was consistent with your presentation. But I just wanted to add this one other thing that I found so interesting, which is I was doing the interviews with the, the Washington State home care co-ops. I guess I was doing them like early this year, like maybe in January and February 2022. And because of the timing, the co-op administrators, like the, the, the COVID phase was still very fresh in people's minds. And it was so interesting to me, one, to hear how these co-ops handled their PPP funds. So just like any small business, they all got bailout funds during COVID. But unlike most private sector businesses in these worker cooperatives, home care cooperatives in Washington state, like the workers, the worker members decided what to do with those PPP funds. And they all had this like deep democratic process where, okay, they got X amount of money and they all made different decisions. Like some of them literally just like cut it up and gave giant checks to people like based on the number of hours worked. And one of the administrators described like handing $6,000 checks to people and it was more money than they'd ever seen. But other co-ops created like a safety net internally. So they were able to create kind of like a sick fund in case people got COVID. And some people sort of tucked the money aside just to see. And then the next year they gave out big profit sharing um, this year. Um, after kind of checking it away. But I just thought, to me, because we always talk about the co-op sector being so underfunded, but it was almost like this little natural experiment of like what happens when you actually sink some capital into this kind of starving sector and how democratically people deliberated over that money and how worker-centric um, the choices were that they made. Thank you. No problem. Thank you for sharing. It was a pleasure to hear your reflections. Just based off of the time, I'm gonna go ahead and pass it on to Jess. But if you have any, if anyone else has any uh, thing else to add, please add it in the chat. Our next presenter is Jess, and they will be sharing their experience with Lonesome Pine Mutual Aid, a network providing community meals, supplies, and other mutual aid resources in Southwest Virginia. So I will pass it on to you. Hi guys, my name is Jess Mullins Fullen. I'm a community organizer for Southern Appalachian Mountain Stewards or SAMS. And before I go further, can everybody hear me? Okay, perfect, perfect. One of the programs of SAMS is Lonesome Pond Mutual Aid. It's been operating for about two years and we do a monthly meal um, that it operates on the basis that people know what they need. We're not going to ask them to verify their income. They're not going to. We're not going to ask them to like only take so much. They take what they need because they know what they need. No questions asked. You can come. You can leave. You can bring people back. You can take some more. It's a distro and it's a meal. And the idea is that we can build community while also supporting our community. And one thing I guess I've thought about a lot is how mutual aid functions almost as an alternative to the traditional systems of capitalism, which can really breed, you know, oppression. Mutual aid, the concept of it, it predates colonialism and it predates capitalism, right? It's, it's something that is innate to human experience. And the term itself was coined by um, a Russian a naturalist and anarcho-communist philosopher named Peter Kropotkin. And it's interesting because Peter wrote a book titled Mutual Aid, the, a factor of evolution that was arguing that mutual aid Okay, so we've all heard of the theory of Darwinism, right? I'm getting ahead of myself. 
I think anybody that's gone to school in like the United States, um, at least the public school system has heard of the theory of evolution and the Darwin's theory of evolution posits that like it's survival of the fittest and um, that's natural selection. In Mutual Aid, A Factor of Evolution, Kropotkin argued that actually, mm, I think that it's not survival of the fittest. I think that species proliferate and are successful when they support one another. When members of that group protect one another, are collaborative with one another, and that is mutual aid. We aid one another to get further. So that's like the scientific spin on it, um, but that's where the term mutual aid, interestingly enough, comes from. Now, in the United States, some of the earliest examples of mutual aid were really coming out of Black and brown communities. And when I say earliest examples, of course, um, I'm speaking following um, colonization, right? So um, Black and brown communities of free people um, in the North. And those are the earliest written examples. Quite positive that there was mutual aid going on, but it wasn't necessarily formalized. And I say that because again, the, the background of mutual aid and one thing that is really poignant in um, mutual aid, a factor of evolution is the quote that says, the mutual aid tendency in man has so remote an origin and is so deeply interwoven with all the past evolution of the human race that it has been maintained by man mankind up to the present time, notwithstanding all the vicissitudes of history. So not to get super like academic or anything, um, it's really just a framework that I'm trying to like build from because again, mutual aid is something that's really innate to human experience. The term mutual aid is from the 1800s, but we've been engaging with mutual aid since the beginning of time. If anything, the reason that there is civilization, the reason that there um, are even conversations around economies or care, economies of care is because they're built on the concept of mutual aid as something that's beneficial and deeply intrinsically tied to being human. So, yeah, I will say that I don't have a ton prepared, uh, like I didn't have a presentation, I don't have a speech, this is kind of thrown together. Tasia Devon was supposed to be here tonight, Tasia was feeling under the weather, so I jumped in. I hope you guys aren't too disappointed, but in, in terms of the way that mutual aid is defined and the way that it works, I think that, and this is me just kind of riffing at this point, I think it's really interesting that you have like this concept of, again, it being an alternative to capitalism and the oppressive systems that are bred out of capitalism and how really in schools, it's not taught as another like, another way that society or societies like build themselves and maintain themselves we're always taught that this is capitalism and and this is the way that the united states or countries around the world kind of like function and i think that it's it's an interesting dot like um sort of dialogue that capitalism is really supported by what we are taught which is survival of the fittest like laissez-faire and um capitalism versus mutual aid as a way that like humanity thrives in terms of how Lonesome Pine mutual aid came around. SAMS is an intersectional environmental justice organization based out of Southwest Virginia and that's far Southwest Virginia so we're in the heart of the coal fields. During the height of the pandemic, you know, I think everything sort of shut down and, and um, everybody was kind of grappling with like, okay, I'm at home. And especially for people who work in the nonprofit sector, it's like, how can we continue to support and help our communities when we're all kind of just um, at a stasis, right? And that's somewhere like that's somewhat where Once Upon Time Mutual Ag came about because there was conversation amongst the members of the org that's like, well, we want to reach people where they're at, 
I know that, you know, impacts of poverty are even greater or, or being failed even being felt even more um, sharply right now because people are losing their jobs, um, because people are having issues with transportation, because people, you know, they can't get to the store to get food because one, they don't have a way to get there. This is a rural community or they don't have the money to support that right now. So members of SAMS rallied around the idea of building out our mutual aid program to be um, a monthly meal and a monthly distro of hygiene and grocery items and monthly because at that point it was mostly a capacity thing you know but that's the idea behind mutual aid you give what you can when you can um, in hopes that really it can proliferate on its own be shared amongst the community and amongst the community members that take advantage of the aid I think that mutual aid works really well anywhere obviously because it's a part of the human experience and the way that we sort of like frame connection with one another. But in Southwest Virginia, you know, in the coal field specifically, so not just when adhering to the arbitrary lines of government drawn states, but when looking at the history of people in the coal fields, right, there's been a long standing history of extraction um, and that's extraction of natural resources whether it's coal or um, lumber or otherwise and there's not even though this coal the power from coal has built you know most of the country at the turn of the century nothing was really brought back in here so I said that the impacts of poverty were felt more sharply during the pandemic and I think that's the case for any low income um, community in the United States, but that is how this area got to the point that it's at and why people, there's been so much tax investment, why there is still so much widespread poverty. And what's interesting is that there have been really like long standing examples of mutual aid and mutual giving in the area that just didn't go by that name. And so it's been successful here and there are a ton of other mutual aid programs that were either um, existing, existent before Lonesome Pine Mutual Aid or that have popped up following mutual, Lonesome Pine Mutual Aid. So it's definitely something that's growing organically because this is a rural area and because we're all separated by mountains. So even though we're close, it takes, you know, 30 or 40 minutes to get to one another. We have mutual aid programs popping up in different counties around us. We have some people reaching out from different communities that Lonesome Pine Mutual Aid traditionally hasn't been able to reach that are saying, I would like to partner with Lonesome Pine Mutual Aid to build something out in my town. So that's something that we're saying right now. And a meal isn't necessarily like you don't have to do a meal in a distro like there's free stores you can have a free store where people just come and take what they need no questions asked and it's stocked either by like by the community so you raise money and people give money and and it's literally just like su the community supporting the community like one thing I like to say which like really it makes it super evident like my Appalachian roots. But one thing I really love to say is like, there ain't nobody that's gonna take care of you like your family, except your community. And that's the idea behind mutual aid community cares for community, period. And it's funny because again, like I'm talking about all of these formula structures of like quote unquote mutual aid. But like, have y'all ever like, I don't know, like had a neighbor be like, can I borrow some flour? And like, what do you expect back from that? You don't, you don't expect them to give you nothing back. Well, honey, you are engaging in the very radical notion of mutual aid. And I say radical because it's somehow been radicalized and it's been made into something that we as a society frame is like, oh, it has to be formalized or, oh, this is, this is outside of like the normal structures of support that I would know. And then it's almost like, because we've been brought up in this society, you know, we're all a product of a rising, right? It's kind of like, sometimes there is this really weird, like, I don't know, um, 
not aversion, but people like come to come to mutual aid and they're like, no, there's no way that I can take without having to give something back. Or there's no way that I can take and like, there won't be questions like, is, do I really deserve this? Should I really take this? And it's like, no, mutual aid doesn't ask those questions. It's aid and it's mutual. Um, and we all benefit in the end. Have I talked for 12 minutes? Yes, you're good. <laughs> okay, I feel like I ain't got nothing else to add. Um, do y'all have any questions? Did I leave anything out? I was kind of just like riffing, so. I have a question. Go ahead. Hi, uh, this is Rhea um, and Jess. I had come down with um, uh, Faith and Money in October. Yes, Rhea, I remember yes, you. Yes. Hi, and I hi. joined yesterday officially to Sam, so I'm a member now. Um, I was wondering on the mutual aid, is it community based that you get? donations to restock your your uh, mutual aid closets or is it that you write grants how do you support that part see that's a really interesting thing about mutual aid and one of the challenges you know mutual aid organizing it is like labor intensive and um, not just like physically but it's emotionally labor intensive it can be mentally labor intensive burnout is common um, it's like pretty much all volunteer led and that's because of capital and it can be difficult to raise funds to keep mutual aid flowing which really is kind of like cyclical and causes people to like be like oh the emotional burnout of it I can't raise money and now I feel bad I put so much time and effort into this Ugh. so like with Sam's we had some money already when we started, when Lonesome Pie Mutual Aid started, just a little bit enough to get it going um, to go out and buy groceries. And that was based off of grants. But there are other mutual aid funds or mutual aid programs that I really like admire that are entirely community-based. Like they have a community fund and people give money. And that is how they, and they immediately give back to the community and they immediately give back. And that's just, that's monetary donations. There are other ways that you can engage in mutual aid. Like when the catastrophic flooding happened in Southeast Kentucky this summer, like people immediately jumped into mutual aid mode, whether, even though they didn't realize, right, that that is what they were doing. People were going to their neighbors and mucking out their houses. They were spending hours like cleaning out mud and pulling out furniture. And like one of the mutual aid programs that's adjacent to us, they spent a lot of time and effort doing that. Now, part of mutual aid is that if you were engaged with the program and somebody says like, oh, I need money like that's what I need right now like that's what you, you got to be like um flexible like that's what you can try to give but it doesn't have to just be based on monetary donations the thing is again we live in a capitalist society so you gotta like if that's what people need they need that for a reason because the oppressive systems that mutual aid is an alternative to if that makes sense thank you you're welcome, and it's really great to hear your voice, Rhea. Well, thank you so much for sharing that information, Jess. It was really well said, and you're not a disappointment at all. That being said, uh, <laughs> let's move on to Garrett. Garrett is going to be speaking about the work that he's been doing with Care Appalachia, an initiative to work with parents, families, and child care providers to research and design ways to improve the quality and accessibility of child care resources. Care Appalachia is a participatory research initiative that engages um, parents and care workers in Southwest Virginia, uh, specifically in the field of child care. Care Appalachia was actually born out of an open call that was put out by audio.org, which is the nonprofit wing of the multinational design consulting firm audio. So they do human centered design research, which um, it's all a little bit esoteric and like corporate, but basically they design uh, artifacts, systems, um, interfaces that are rooted in um, human needs and human experiences. And IDEO.org, their design wing, does the same thing, but 
with like a, a little bit more community focused, uh, a little bit more philanthropic. And they, they oftentimes put out um, like design sprints that invite individuals to um, individuals with lived experience to pose their own solutions to problems. So they put out one for child care. And I wrote a proposal um, about what I imagine child care should look like in 2040. And my vision of child care in 2040 was uh, cooperative. It was rooted in community and it was rooted in um, the needs and voices of care workers and of families. So they gave me basically $100,000 to do something actionable to move towards my, my vision of what I think I thought based on my own intuition and my own experience of my community uh, would work. And so I decided to use that resource to pay childcare workers and parents and families directly for their expertise. And they were paid as experts. It, it wasn't like a traditional type of honorarium. Um, I really sought to compensate people as if they were I like a professional consultant, you know, the same type of fees that you would offer a lawyer or an accountant or a bookkeeper. That's what I thought the parents and care workers that I was engaging with deserved. And so folks that were invited into that process either set for a preliminary interview or a series of interviews, depending on their availability um, and their uh, willingness to kind of commit to the process. The idea is that, yes, this is participatory research, but this is really an act of community sense making developing a deep understanding of the collective sentiments in our community. Um, so the methodology that guided this project is not only rooted in traditional participatory action research, but really in the Appalachian cultural tradition of story making and sh story sharing. Our process began by inviting caretakers, parents, and others who were concerned and impacted by childcare issues to share their stories. We then comb through these interviews for points of synth synthesis, common thematic elements echoed across the diverse experiences of our communities. These themes were condensed into five major calls for action and a set of th thematic um, foci that, that emerged from the process. And it was really through honing in on these calls to action, which are direct, um, directly drawn from the voices of these parents and these child care workers and the themes that emerge in these conversations, um, those together really provided a kind of baseline indication that in many ways what parents and care workers, child care workers in Appalachia are calling for is more cooperativization, cooperativization of the care industry. Um, so I'm gonna read you all some of the themes and the core calls to action that emerged from those conversations. So the th first theme was that it takes a village and I'm gonna read a quote. Someone said, being from Central Appalachia and growing up here, there's something very community-based and communal about the way that family and the wider community functions. There's an appreciation and respect of family, elders, and of the kinship unit, even if it's outside of one's own. And I think that harkens back to the idea that it takes a village. That thing that it take, takes a village really was consistent um, across from so many of the conversations. Uh, the second theme was the economic landscape has changed, so caring should change too. Folks talk about how the nuclear family only worked when the mom stayed home. And a lot of mothers, specifically mothers, in, in the instance of my interviews, expressed that they were frustrated at the prospect of being forced out of the economy due to the prohibited cost of childcare. Another theme was that caring is a gender justice issue. Again, many uh, people that women and gender marginalized people were talking about how lack of access to childcare was really limiting their ability to show up as their full selves in their community. One of the quotes we got from that is, someone said, lack of access to childcare is impeding my career trajectory. If I could afford better childcare, if it was available, if it was easier to access, and I could pay people more to watch them, that would be great, but I can't. And I think there's a, a stigma around childcare, especially for women. Many mothers talked about the frustrating the frustration of being expected to work and being expected to care um, for their children as if they had time to fully um, commit to both of those and resources to fully commit to both of those 
Another core theme was how lack of access to care creates stress and trauma for young families. And I'm going to run through these. The last one was the importance of choice. Um, these interviews were all happening against the backdrop of Roe being repealed. So there was a lot of conversation around how important it is that we build infrastructure that allows people to make choices around what their family structure needs to look like and how their care arrangements work. The calls to action, the first one was professionalizing caring and passing the torch. There was a lot of interest in creating pathways for experienced care providers to pass on their, their cultural knowledge and their embodied knowledge that they had learned from many, many years of acting as care providers. But there was also conversation around how professional licensing and licensure serve to kind of like reinforce white supremacist, cis heteropatriarchal ideas around childcare. So there was a call to um, kind of think beyond professional licensure, but also to treat people working in childcare with the same respect and the same dignity that we treat other professionals, such as medical providers, right? There is also an argument for increased network services, like creating vetted, trustworthy, and reliable networks to provide service for parents and families in the case of emergencies or other situationally specific child care needs. Connecting care, child care to broader community resources and to the community at large. So there is a desire to um, develop better mechanisms to connect child care workers and the families they serve with broader networks of support, including mental health services, social services, and education for parents and care providers. And the last one was, caring is a skilled profession and it's hard work and we should treat it that way. And care providers should be compensated fairly and they should have benefits. And I had to rush through all those. I have quotes in the voices of the folks that I interviewed for every one of those points. And again, these were, themes and calls to action that emerged across conversations. So it's not just like one person said any one of these things. These were all kind of stated in the collective voice. And what I'm trying to share with y'all is that these themes and these call to actions all point to the fact that care providers and parents and families are calling to, calling for some type of cooperativized, collectivized approach to care that doesn't put the onus of child care on individual parents, individual families. And so the goal of this research is to make the case for investment into cooperative child and family care in this specific context where these parents and care workers called for it. So thank y'all for listening. Thank you, Garrett. That was great. You're doing such great research and I'm sure all of us are like, amazed. I know I'm amazed. Um, yes, yeah, so we will be moving on to our last speaker tonight, which is Joe Fields Johnson. Joe is a primary care doctor with Dandelion Health where they take pride in providing clear and, and convenient primary care with transparent pricing anchored in dignity. It's nice to meet y'all and thank, thank you for all the speakers that went before me. So yeah, I'm a family physician here in Richmond, Virginia. My role in the care economy as a physician is orchestrating a lot of the more medical management for patients and kind of understanding them. But the real unique thing I, that I'm doing um, is the actual model of care that I'm providing, which is called direct primary care. I'll give you some context and I'll tell you a little bit about what direct primary care is. So, you know, family medicine as a specialty, that's my, my specialization, was started in the 1960s to reassert the need for physicians to be in the community, to understand patients in context of their lives, in their families, in their neighborhoods, that we need to really move out from the hospital and away from a lot of the shifts to more institutionalized settings for care. Over the years, so in that time, a lot of primary care was practiced as a independent practice, independent business. You know, an individual or a few physicians would provide that care, and that was the predominant norm. It was not a perfect system, as 
I'm sure I'll need to explain to you all, like physicians are tend to come from privilege, tend to be white dudes like me um, with backgrounds with people with that have a lot of, uh, a lot of advantages. So that being said, over the years, the independent practice and ability for, for physicians to care for their patients in ways that they think was the best was really shifted. So a lot of uh, the complexity of medicine, the specialization with a lot of different subspecialists and then how people are paid. So um, insurance companies and controlled care payment models really shifted a lot of medical practice to be corporate. So that removed a lot of the independent practice and like direct patient relationship to be more, okay, we're gonna have large health systems, large conglomerates of, of physicians working together and it being more about how do we like sustain this corporation and meet its bottom line and while providing care. And the ostensible goal is to provide good care. But as a lot of you, uh, probably every one of you experienced the more formalized healthcare system in many ways, it's very uncomfortable as a patient and there's a lot of poor treatment. And a lot of that isn't fully attributable, but it's partially attributable to this little corp corporatization of medicine. And so as a family physician myself, I worked in a health center um, uh, called La Clinica de Arasa in Oakland, California. The health centers were, came out of the kind of countercultural revolution of the 60s to really reground primary care in neighborhoods. And the original ones were really kind of solidarity clinics, and those really shifted a lot in some ways. But the clinic I worked in was a, um, a clinic that was formed in the De La Raza movement, which was modeled after kind of alongside the Black Panther clinics that were started in the late 60s and early 70s. And when I came back to Richmond, I wanted to find a way to help people get access to dignified care that was affordable and was meeting a need that was not available now. So from a care economy perspective, there's a lot, there are a lot of people in Virginia and in, in Richmond who don't have access to insurance. They don't qualify for Medicaid and they they don't get insurance through their employment. <laughs> nor are they making enough money in their, when they're budgeting their, their lives to be able to afford a marketplace plan. One of the reasons why people can't get help th those models is because of being un undocumented. You can't qualify for Medicaid in Virginia if you're undocumented unless you're pregnant. My practice works very differently than other clinical practices to solve some of these problems. It doesn't solve all of them. So direct primary care is a model of monthly membership payments. It's not health insurance. What, what someone is paying is for their access to me and my services and what I'm able to do and uh, assess and treat and what procedures I'm able to do. And that cost is starts at $55 per month for a young adult and goes up to $95 for an elder. And then if a kid is a parent in the practice, so kids can come on their own if their parents bring them, of course. But if, if their parents are enrolled, that's $15 a month. The goal is for this to be something that's reasonably affordable and accessible for most people in that category, knowing it's not affordable for everyone because um, that, that's hard. And to supplement the safety net system that's here in Richmond, like free clinics, other health centers um, that are really overwhelmed and a lot of these patients that I'm care for wouldn't qualify for anyway. And through that membership, my patients have an hour long visit with me to really get to know them, to really anchor a relationship because trust and Dignity in a relationship is really the foundation of how healthcare should be, though it's not the norm. And then building off of that relationship and really understanding their, you know, their medical conditions, their mental health conditions, and how they integrate together. In my practice, we have very low cost lab testing. So it's like three, four dollars for a lot of common labs, which if any of you have gotten labs before, they can be quite expensive. So it's about 90% less expensive than most like normal cash payment. And then medications, we have our own pharmacy and we sell medication that's wholesale. It's um, as affordable as we're able to turn, turns into like between six and $12 for like a one to three month supply for common generic medicines, not for expensive things. And we have like antibiotics and blood pressure medicine, some diabetes medicine, things like that. 
and like birth control. And I have, I have medication abortion that I provide for my patients. So making these services affordable is, is a great opportunity for them. So one, one clear way of like being participating in the care economy is people and my patients, some of them have chosen to leave job situations that are like unsafe or that they don't feel like they're cared for, which many workers that don't have. And so they've gone to gig work, left places where they have insurance and health coverage. So they have to find an alternative way to get health care. And this is one way they can do that. Other people are entrepreneurial. They're starting their own business. They're creative people and they don't have benefits because they're really you know, trying to figure things out financially while they're doing their creative work. Part of what I see as what the, my clinic can do is partner with cooperative businesses. One, it's really challenging for any worker to start a worker-owned cooperative or to start any business because of healthcare. It's one of the biggest obstacles for people. So though I'm not providing all healthcare, I'm not a hospital, I don't have all the specialties, I can provide like 80, 90% of most care, urgently, ongoing care, gender-affirming hormone therapy, some mental health services and common assessment and prescription. And so this model is one way that someone could use and get healthcare more affordably with dignity while pursuing growing a business that's more um, worker owned and controlled. And so I partner with like a Afterglow Coffee as a group in Richmond. I'm not partnering directly with them, but I talk to them about a lot about the potential for maybe supporting them in their healthcare needs, but also like just like being more cooperative and sharing cooperative models of business development in Richmond. In addition, we are going to either be a worker cooperative or a worker self-directed nonprofit. And what that would mean is that the, the licensed physicians and the worker cooperative would be the co-owners. So there wouldn't be someone really managing down to so be more of a democratic workplace. So we're really responsive to all of the workers' needs. And though physicians are a very privileged um, class in society, um, there is a lot of stressors and burnout and frustration by not having that control. And so that's something that we can we can switch. Or we're, we're strongly working with a lawyer here who does cooperative law in Richmond. Um, but starting a nonprofit. And that nonprofit could open a few windows for sliding scale payments for this monthly fee, having more of a solidarity fund to help people get, you know, even reduce that cost even more, uh, among other things, and helping our workers get loan forgiveness for their, their training loans. So we have a lot of ideas for growth going forward. My goal is to really be a resource so that I'm connected to not only the, like the, the real important health outcomes for people and helping to help them to be healthy now in the future, but also the financial harm of healthcare and helping them have more democratic control of their own health. And my, I really see myself as a partner for them. So it's an honor to be here and share a little bit of that. I'm happy to explain anything if you all have questions. Thank you so much. It was great to hear that information, especially coming from Rich and myself to like see that that work is being done down there. So that was all the speakers that we have for tonight. Originally, our framing question after these talks was to ask what are our alternative models that address some of these challenges, but I do think that we've addressed a lot of that so far. If anyone has anything to add to that question as an answer, please go ahead and say that in the chat. Um, but for now, I'll pass it on to Matthew for synthesizing. Thanks, Patricia. I mean, there's so um, much amazing work, especially when you have people, even when you have people coming from such different places and geographies and cultures and contexts, it's really amazing to see threads. Like I'll say for me, the thread of family is a, was a, is a, is a constant thread, uh, how, whatever form that takes. It doesn't have to be the Plutonic family, right? If it's a community that provide support resources, but the importance of family, or I would say even adding to that, like thinking about Joseph's comments about providing healthcare with dignity is such a huge and huge piece of what a care economy is about. You know, thinking a lot about the finances, both of the cost of, of healthcare at the moment, but 
you know, providing alternative means to resources in different ways. Like if it's a community pulling money together or if it's pulling food together, the, the role that that plays in a lot of this work um, of both being a limiting thing, but we also know that there there is abundance. We, we live in communities abundance and that abundance is accessible if we find ways to, to make it accessible to others. One of the things that also came back to me a lot of was like when Jess was talking about the the naming of, of mutual aid, it's been happening for a long time. It goes, it's been, it's a part of a culture, but until we start to name it and start to like, sometimes it feels like when you start to say it, it actually becomes real in different ways. And that's what I too, I, I really enjoy hearing from Joe and Garrett in terms of, of stating that there is an alternative um, and that we don't just be accepting the, the way things are, the status quo, we can find alternatives, we can seek alternatives. And by listening to others and taking the time to listen, we can create those op- those opportunities. So I kind of turn it back over to you all now with the little time we have left, just to have a, a conversation about other maybe themes or, or resonances that have come out. You know, the speakers, like, I'm, we welcome you all to kind of like comment on each other's ideas and things that you were hearing. Well, one thing that struck me just was how important norms and belief systems were at the local level, how they anchored whatever the initiative was. Like in Oregon, the, I mean, basically what they're talking about is the Oregon way. The, um, we're just part of a culture there. Um, uh, collaborate, collaboration um, it comes from the old uh, barn raising um, model. Uh, people who settled the, the far Northwest. Um, mutual aid, the reciprocity is embedded in, um, in everything. It, it's, it's not a one-to-one reciprocity and it's not the same thing that you're giving to the same person or, or group. It's, it's what happens over the course of time in a community. You know, sometimes you give, sometimes you take, and it's not just the same people that you don't give to the same people you take from or whatever. The community is anchored in in the, in the concept of, of, of reciprocity, um, and then the the community sense making um, that Garrett was talking about, uh, just coming into uh, coming into clarity about these big themes. This is this is who we are. Uh, so all of that was um, uh, it's, it's really impressive uh, how much how important whatever the initiative is, um, how, how important a belief system is, how important local norms are. Yeah. Thanks, Barb, appreciate that. Anybody else want to pick up on that? This is Rhea. I'm from a pretty large area. I'm from a county of 1 million people and it's in Northern Virginia. And I always say I'm a Virginian. Um, I'm just working in my head, like how, how are mutual aids up in this area? And one thing about so many people is that it's very easy to feel powerless, even when I know I can provide and offer services or offer help because we do have a board of supervisors and we hear from our, our representatives almost every week in a newsletter and that sort of thing. And so you kind of feel like, how do I get engaged um, in that regard? So that's one of my struggles. Can I speak to that a little bit? Sure. Okay. Okay. Yeah. I'm not originally from Nova. I'm from Midlothian, Virginia. But I'm up here in Fairfax right now studying uh, sociology and Spanish. Uh-huh. And the culture shock is, is real compared to like down south uh, area compared to like up north of Virginia. Um, it's definitely a different um, energy. But George Mason is the largest public school or public university in Virginia. There's like almost 40,000 students. <clears throat> so I have also kind of questioned like, how do I make an impact? at the largest public university in Virginia. And I think working with BA Sen has been very enlightening in that regard because I have adopted so many new um, ideas and information that I didn't know before 
this semester started, but also being able to see like there's already people that kind of there's students of, um, here that are already thinking about the same question, already processing how do I make an impact among so many others? How do I let my voice be heard? And I think it might be attributed to the fact that we're all just really young and excited about this stuff, but I think that it's kind of just about finding those people that are already thinking about the same things because they're going to be out there. Um, it might seem hard in a population of one million, but maybe uh, having those conversations with someone that you know and asking them, because we talked about this question before in another learning was like, how do you find care? Like, how do you get support in your day-to-day -day life? And just kind of bringing that question up to your, to your peers um, that live up here and building on that conversation to see where the need is and how you can continue to support those who need something. I hope that it kind of related to your experience. Thank you, that, that's helpful. I do know that we do have a lot of boards that actually pay people to be on them uh, in, our, in our county government. Um, I, I experienced a few years back that being in a structure like that, they tie your hands from doing certain things. Talking to you now, um, it's kind of interesting because I, I, I can't work with the government if I wanna do things like mutual aid. And that's why I'm excited with Sam's because I know I can do my part some kind of way as I get to know the folks in that group. But I should be able to do that even in my own community. So um, hearing that from you is helpful. Thank you. You're welcome. And just to bring this up in the chat, Erica, um, I can I can read it, or if you want to say it, um, you're welcome to come and speak speak it. Um, but she says one of the questions that's coming up for me is how we can include impacted folks in these conversations as well. I think learning about things like co-ops and mutual aid is great, and these conversations are very high level. It seems like for me, having Spanish translation and hearing what care workers want need. Uh, would also be helpful as we continue thinking about the care economy with action in mind. So I think that actually I want to bring forward this, even though we're almost done, is that I think these conversations about care economy and, and building cooperative, uh, cooperative to support a care economy are starting to grow. There's, a, there's enough people, I think, now, whereas for a long time we've been talking about co-ops, but we have been able to like think about like how do we build something. So um, just in the last few months, um, a few of us have been talking to the National Domestic Workers Alliance, um, who's doing some um, work around home health care workers and, and rights, doing some work around um, daycare workers, um, domestic uh, you know, custodial staff working. They're, they're doing a lot of work on the rights, making sure that those people have their rights kind of encoded in law. But I think like, the next question is like, how do we can also support the economic justice of that work too, and thinking about the, those possibilities. And so I know in Barb's presentation, I think we'll share that link. There, there are federal grants that we can pursue that maybe might be a possibility for, for helping develop some kind of home healthcare cooperative, but on a larger scale that could actually also not only provide people's economic, for economic support, but thinking a lot about how do we build a base of power to kind of, you know, shift labor, shift some of these systems that are so entrenched and don't want to move. So that's something that is out there. And I think it's something we want to continue to talk about um, and try to build a, a group of people around continuing to think about. And so that's something I think we'll, we'll, we'll kind of reach out to everybody and, and then in probably in the new year, start to have a, have a deeper conversation about um, and trying to build that and realize that. Well, I, um, I, one thing that's coming up for me is I feel like today we've kind of been talking about childcare in one camp or category and then healthcare in kind of a separate category. But I think um, that those, I, I wonder if there are models that 
interweave that work. And my friend Tasha is here. Hi, I'm so excited that you joined. But I think when we were talking last time, you were telling me how some days your work is childcare, and then the next day it may be taking care of someone in that needs more of like a home or healthcare situation. So how those care working jobs can be, you know, different day to day. And so I just wonder yeah. what kind of models there are that um, consider both aspects of, of care or all aspects of care work. Yes, they are all very similar. You're, you're taking care of, you're doing the same work physically it's just some people need more work than others. Like the kids, some kids need more work than others, depending on the circumstance. If the kid has like autism or cerebral palsy, then they're gonna need more care than a kid without it because they are limited to what they can do. And the same for elderly, some can function a little bit more. Some have dementia to where you have to constantly remind them of their day-to-day -day life. They forget, you know, and these are people's families. So you also have to talk to the families and everything like that to make sure everything flows together. But it can be hard mentally and physically for us because we're also risking our health by taking care of them, especially our back and everything like that. And I think we are overworked and underappreciated. Absolutely. I know you were working earlier. Tasha is actually in California, so our timing is didn't... very different. Yeah, yeah it is different. <laughs> but the beginning of this call kind of went spoke to a lot of that as well so um hopefully you'll get the recording if it's helpful but I guess I'll kind of move us into uh different opportunities to stay in touch with each other and to continue this conversation I know yeah. within the Virginia Solidarity Economy Network we are shifting to a platform called Zulip and it's similar to Slack um but I'm going to drop this in the chat and we'll have a, a specific kind of thread or space where we can continue talking about the care economy. And then we also have our an email listserv. We have a website where we're where we're posting newsletters and blogs and invitations to more events like that. With our learnings, um, this has happened on each one where of course we're just, we're really just seeding conversations and then we're gonna have to, um, you know, figure out the work of really continuing them or figuring out okay, how to move from discussion to action. And so I just wanna say thank you for, for being here. Um, I hope that, that you know, we'll keep talking and that this was just the beginning of um, deeper relationships with each other. Is everybody here from Virginia or live in Most, Virginia? Yeah, a lot of us have moved different places, but the, most of the conversation tonight was based on what's going on um, in Virginia, but we're also learning from other places um, to see yeah. what can we replicate here in our state. Okay. Um, so I think we're, I saw another question in the chat, um, but we're at 7.30 as well. So I invite you to hang out if you have more questions, but we're also, um, feel free to, to sign out as well. And thank you again.